we've been talking, Jeffrey and I have, uh, uh, you know, to ourselves, we've been talking about the uh, the subject of uh, transhumanism and the crossbreeding that was going on back in the 30s and 40s and probably even before that in Russia back in 19, early 1900s and then follow up in Germany uh, with the whole idea of crossbreeding animals and humans together <coughs> and excuse me and the uh, the Nazi experiments that were going on uh, before <coughs> and are still going on today um, the the whole w world network what we would refer to as the Nazi party the whole Nazi operation is very very well high uh, highly financed extremely well positioned in the world to uh, to carry on the Nazi ideology, and uh, so while we may think that uh, the Nazis were defeated <clears throat> in the Second World War, nothing could be further from the truth. They are very healthy and doing quite well, thank you. They have plenty of money. They have uh, all the technology, uh, the German mines that were brought here uh, to America and to the uh, and to uh, Central and South America, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, U uh, Uruguay and Paraguay. Uh, our Americas, uh, North and Central and South America, are just uh, re replete with, uh, with Nazi scientists, Nazi uh, uh, theoreticians, and so uh, the, uh, what was going on behind the scenes, uh, and I do mean way behind the scenes of what we came to know as Nazism in Germany, there was a bigger picture going on behind the Nazi empire. And this is why uh, the United States and the British and European bankers and, uh, and industrialists were financing with money, with uh, food, materials, uh, the big oil companies, the you know, automotive industry in America and Europe were financing, providing uh, oil and, and half trucks and tanks and jeeps and all the equipment needed for war was being provided to the Nazis by the United States and by uh, the UK, corporations in the UK, and in Europe in general, and so behind the scenes of what we today think of as Nazi movement or the Nazi party was a far, far bigger, big, bigger operation going on in which American uh, money and, uh, and, and industry was highly, highly interested in and was, and was financing and uh, producing products for the Nazis to use in the war. So the bottom line was that there's something far bigger going on than what you think yeah, <clears throat> the Nazis were involved in. And, uh, and that is the whole entire restructuring of the human race. And it had nothing to do with politics at all. It has to do with something far, far bigger, far more dynamic. It has to do with the complete change over of uh, human civilization to a to a totalitarian dictatorship around the world, in which the whole entire human family on the earth will eventually, according to their plan, will eventually be sucked into an absolute uh, new world order. And this is where we've heard uh, all of our politicians, all of our favorite politicians in America talking about the, and they're gleefully and happily talking about the coming new world order. Of course, Adolf Hitler talked about the new world order. The uh, Nazis were, were very big on, on publishing articles and talking about the new world order. And so also in Russia, Russia and the, and with the takeover of Russia by the communists, they began talking about the new world order that they foresaw. 
And so the bottom line is, is that it was not it was ultimately not just a war between the East and the West, or between the uh, between the Allies and between the Allies in Germany, but there was a bigger war going on behind the scenes that I personally believe uh, way far outweighed uh, the human invo involvement. It was ob obviously, to my way of thinking, obviously something far, far more dangerous and more evil than the war itself. And that is the real, uh, <clears throat> the real purpose behind financing, organizing, directly and directing the whole world Nazi movement. And that is some kind of a, of a, of a hidden, uh, you might say conspiracy, some sort of a hidden, uh, agenda to recreate the whole human race. And, uh, so we know that there was a lot of that kind of experimentation going on in Nazi Germany. Um, back in the 1938, 39, uh, in Hollywood, uh, movie actor Charles Lawton made a movie in Hollywood called The Island of Lost Souls. Charles Lawton, 1938, 39, The Island of Lost Souls. Uh, later on, I remember that in 1965, I think it was, Burt Lancaster made a, uh, a remake of The Island of Lost Souls, and it was called The Island of Dr. Moreau. And, of course, the last movie that uh, Marlon Brando made before his passing was The Island of Dr. Moreau. And it's an extraordinary story based on real factual uh, events in the history of the world where very, very evil people, scientists and politicians, were conspiring together to crossbreed, uh, to crossbreed animals and humans. Uh, it's an extraordinary story, and there's a lot of information out there on that. But most people have never heard of the real background to what Nazis were doing, to what the, uh, what the, the elite who are financing, organizing, and directing all of this demonic depravity, what their vision of the future for the human race really is. And so that's what we want to talk about tonight with uh, Jeffrey and myself. The, uh, the idea that there's a whole, uh, there's a whole uh, war going on to undermine the human civilization and to ultimately uh, completely destroy it and put in its place on the earth a whole new kind of human. And this is what we are, are enjoying the very beginnings of with computers, because computers go all the way back to Nazi Germany. I mean, the, you know, the, the Germans had computers. And, uh, and after the, after the Second World War, computers started catching on very big in industry. And today they're everywhere. And so on the one hand, uh, computers are fascinating and wonderful for communication. But you gotta remember it has the dark side too. And it was developed by a lot of the uh, technology was developed by the Germans and the Nazis in particular. So uh, we wanted to talk about the, the transformation of the human race by, as I said, a well-heeled, well-financed, highly organized, and very powerful Nazi movement in the world today. And if you, and if you don't understand what I mean, you better listen closely to people like uh, Joseph Farrell. You need to listen to uh, an extraordinary uh, researcher and author named Joseph Farrell, F-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. He talks a lot about the modern-day Nazi world movement, and it's behind so much of going on in the Middle East. That was Nazis that were in the Middle East uh, uh, before. They still are today. So much of what's going on in Europe and in, uh, and in the Middle East today, without a doubt, has Nazi uh, theoreticians, politicians, uh, scientists working to overthrow that whole area of the world, and God knows what they're planning on doing with it. So 
I just wanted to talk a little bit about this strange uh, kind of science that's going on right now that people, generally speaking, are not aware of. And uh, I want to play a, a little three or four minute piece that uh, is that, that I think is very interesting, talking about the uh, underworld of, of occult sciences manipulating the human race and also the implication that the UFO and the alien presence in this story might be far bigger and more important than you think it is. So I want to play this little piece for you. It's only about three, three and a half minutes long, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Okay. The method, as they called it, though it was more so a germline procedure of singular metascientific complexity, had been given to them by the alien colonists as a quid pro quo. The syndicate would help them to create a population of alien hybrids who would hide in plain sight, cloned from human ova and alien biomaterial. So there would be a clone race immune to the effects of the black oil when the return to the planet began. For this, the syndicate would be sequestered, granted a sort of immunity or asylum, given a place in the grander scheme. They were the Vichy government to the German final solution, collaborationists whose motivation was simple, self-directed survival. These cloning operations were spread across the country, the cataloging and record-keeping done through a complex intra-institutional system that connected to every branch of government, from the Social Security Administration to the Department of Defense. The operation, under the working title Purity Control, had been launched in 1948, its original conception the brainchild of German scientists given immunity themselves from war crimes and allowed to continue the eugenic experiments that were Hitler's dark legacy. The syndicate had begun as a subset of a shadow intelligence agency whose original orders were to create plausible denial and an effective cover-up of purity control. But through 50 years, numerous U.S. and U.N. administrations, the principles began to wrest control, accumulating power and influence across international borders. Such that by 1990, the operation ceased to have a member accountable to any one government and whose only orders will be taken from a man named Strugholt, a German industrialist who had fled his homeland to northern Africa. These men, whose knowledge and access provided control of a foreseeable future, had in spite of this everything to lose. Their secret work, the cloning preparations, and the cataloging constituted their greatest vulnerability, exposure. Their detection would ensure not just their own demise, but a far-reaching dissolution of social and religious order around the globe. To protect against this, the syndicate employed methods of disinformation, using covert government programs that had been regrettably discovered as a kind of smokescreen. A dodge or blind where the transgressions of Congress accountable agencies served to hide their own more odious undertaking. They had even at times used the UFO phenomenon to create an hysteria that science and the intelligentsia denounced so completely as to make belief and believers seem ridiculous and completely discreditable. They had also, in a crisis, used a tool of the colonists themselves, alien bounty hunters who policed the cloning operations and enforced rule on the countdown to colonization, a double-edged sword whose cold-blooded tactics could help to stem a leak or threat, but who also kept a watch on the syndicate, a threat in itself as the syndicate had something to hide that not even the colonists knew of, a vaccine against the black oil, an inoculant against the substance in which the alien life force was held. In fact, the very medium of the life force itself. To guard this secret was perhaps even more critical than the truth of the existence of alien life and of colonization. If the syndicate's own secret vaccine were discovered, a vaccine that would make themselves immune from the effects of the black oil, they would certainly be destroyed and the timetable for colonization stepped up. They would protect this secret with their lives. They would kill to protect it, as it symbolized the only hope they had of avoiding enslavement when the planet was overtaken. That they had been able to, over decades, conduct their work on the vaccine undetected was a result of a code among the syndicate members that put honor and the future above personal politics. But now this code was beginning to break down, an incipient scramble for power beginning to develop, a threat from within that doubled the threat from without. All right, this piece that we just heard was taken from the X-Files music, uh, uh, music audio um, and it was on there, and uh, just using it to illustrate uh, what I'm talking about, that there is an ongoing scientific 
worldwide scientific uh, work going on, which we in America, we refer to it as black ops and black projects, meaning they are hidden from view from the public. But these black, uh, black ops of uh, crossbreeding animals with humans and uh, doing whatever the Nazis ultimately had in mind to do with their alien uh, knowledge and technology. Uh, I'm completely, uh, I'm completely uh, sure in my mind that the, the whole operation of what we call the Nazi movement around the world uh, was was being orchestrated behind the scenes uh, by very powerful men, elitists, what we would call elitists in America, uh, who are themselves connected to secret societies and fraternal orders, which are, are financing, organizing, directing, financing, and feeding uh, and producing materials for the Nazi Party today, right now today, just as they were doing it during the Second World War. And so many of our banks in America uh, made their money and were became wealthy during the war uh, because of their financing uh, the war for Adolf Hitler and sending him all the raw materials that he needed. So I think that there's some sort of a world catastrophe coming where the human family is slowly but surely being uh, being phased out in preference to a new civilization of people which will be uh, which will have no connection to the freedom, the liberties, the justice, the uh, the emotional foundations for civilization. All of that will be uh, weeded out soon. All of that's going to uh, eventually be dropped, and we will have a new kind of civilization where people will be enslaved in a totalitarian dictatorship worldwide, but it won't be as so obvious. People will blend themselves to it. People will uh, bend to the uh, the prevailing powers that be, and uh, and we already see that even in America, even in Europe, we're seeing uh, you know the people of Europe and America are very easily bending themselves and and uh, and accepting and submitting to the totalitarian fascist world movement which I am saying again is, is being orchestrated behind the scenes by the world Nazi movement. But uh, people don't, don't really seem to see what they're doing. They're just being sucked into the system and do not realize what they're being sucked into. So today we have Americans who are, are, are delighted to put on the uniforms, take the billy clubs, take the, uh, take the badges, and now they have been given permission by the Führer to uh, do whatever they want. They can they can play God at the airports. They can play God on the streets. Uh, the police are playing God over the whole human race. Everybody has to be in compliance to the Führer and to Berlin. This whole monstrosity of of, of uh, destruction of law and order is just an amazing to me how the people of America and Europe and the world in general will will bend to this and put on the uniforms and go and you know, and go right along with subjugating their their own fellow man their fellow citizens um, how many people Americans are in these agencies like the FBI the CIA and NSA the Americans you know, coming from the same country we are, and yet they are working day and night behind the scenes to destroy our country, our freedoms, our our people, our morals, our ethics. They're working day and night to destroy their own country and their own people. And so all of this I see as all part and parcel of some sort of a some sort of a world movement to ultimately destroy the very foundations of civilization. And there's an article that just appeared 
uh, on the Organic Consumers Association put out an, an article that was entitled, New Federal Guidelines Will Allow the Creation of Human-Animal uh, uh, Genetics to Crossbreed Humans and Animals. So we now have the federal government saying, oh, "Well, it's okay to do that. We'll, we're just going to, we're just going to uh, experiment. We're not going to do anything with it. We're just going to experiment and see if we can crossbreed animals and humans." So that should tell you something about Washington D.C. and about government throughout the world. Uh, how far gone mentally and emotionally and spiritually and integrity uh the governments of this world and especially Washington DC, how far gone they really are and how far removed from humanity they really are. People are mentally and criminally insane. Crossbreeding animals and humans. Uh it's it's just a a frightening story, but I know that it has something to do with the background of the Nazi movement, because so many hundreds, if not thousands, of Nazi scientists were brought here uh, and, and to America, and they became very well entrenched in our government, and today they're carrying out their Nazi uh, philosophies and ideas uh, right under our noses, and we call it the U.S. government, never realized for a minute where this great country of America and the rest of the world with us, where we're really going. So that's what we wanted to talk about tonight. And I have my friend Jeffrey, which I have I have uh, hogged too much of the show. I want to bring Jeffrey on because there's so many things he brings up that's very interesting to me. So uh, we wanted to just play you that part, and that was from the X-Files. Uh, but anyway, Jeffrey, are you still with us? Absolutely. I heard everything you said, and... Uh... You know, it's, uh, thank you for having me on the show again. I really appreciate it and uh, giving me an opportunity to be part of something really uh, extraordinary. Uh, the subject matter that you're talking about, I had to create um, a, a way of handling it because it's so difficult to swallow all this stuff that uh, I tried to do a lot of stuff like go out and, and hang out with friends and see movies and enjoy uh, shopping at farmer's markets and doing all this stuff because it's such heavy-duty stuff. Um, so I, I always try to, to, to remind myself that you know, there has to be a, as much of a balance as possible to enjoy your life and enjoy the, 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 the blessings in your life uh, and create value with your fa family and friends as much as possible. And getting to the subject of what you're talking about, this uh, Nazi movement, these these programs, the clip that you played, I, I really, a um, couple of things stood out to me is that they were saying in the 40s, and there's a multi-decade project. Uh, well, you know, the thing that I've been trying to understand, and it's something I've tried to relay in the last two shows, is that whatever we're learning on the Internet today, or whatever we're finding in books it's most of the time older than what is being said. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I, I found in the beginning is we were talking about artificial intelligence before we go to the transhumanism stuff, is that a corporation is a precursor to, its, you know, to artificial intelligence. And devices that would be considered computers, they've existed for thousands of years, like the Antikythera device mechanism found off the coast of Greece. Uh, it's dated way back, you know, almost 2,000 years old, mapping out the, the, the cycles of the planets, the moon, uh, even the four-year uh, four year calendar, which, which is basically the precursor to the Olympic game cycle every four years. Uh, so when you move into the transhumanism, well, I'm thinking – you know, there's a lot of modern day examples that I'm going to attach to that clip that you played. But transhumanism, uh, to me, uh, is in my face apparent in Egypt. And the reason why is because even though I'm not an expert on hieroglyphics, uh, but Hollywood and Egypt itself and their hieroglyphics, they have all kinds of humans with animal heads. And it's been going on for a long time. So that's a little bit of an assumption on my end. But it wouldn't surprise me that there were there was an intellectual understanding that somehow that knowledge of 
of crossbreeding chimeras and all this kind of stuff. It's been going on for a long time, but now it's it's big business and it's big money. It's not about control and social order. It, it's about making money and preparing the whatever's left of the human family for intergalactic uh, travel. And this is the subject I used to shy away from because, you know, it just sounds too fruit loopy. Um, it, you know, it's like, how do you prove this to somebody? How do you transmit this kind of concept if they haven't looked at it at all? And not come across like, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, where are you getting this from? How can you confirm any of it? Well, transhumanism, the first ancient example, as I mentioned, is in the hieroglyphs, but, uh, there's, uh, stuff that I found that's just absolutely mind boggling. I actually had to lay down and rest because I couldn't handle it at first. It is a, um, in 1940, the Russians, uh, supposedly they have a video and, you know, again, I would, this is not for the faint of heart and it's definitely not for children. Um, but, you know, some people, they say, well, I don't believe any of this stuff and I don't believe it until I see it. Well, I think you can go on YouTube and can type in Russian scientist successfully reanimates dead dog's head in 1940. If you type in something to that effect, you'll find it. It's like a two or three minute thing or, and it's, it's the real deal. And, um, you know, it starts off with uh, these kinds of programs that you're talking about, these militarized programs, where they they want to see what can be done and how it can be done, and they can sign. And if this movie came out in 1940, God knows what they were doing. Again, going back to the first concept of that, whatever you see now, it's older than what it's said. It said what it's being said, and so uh, maybe this might be hundreds of years old. Um, but this is the first time that they're willing to show it. That must mean that they're way, way, way ahead. And uh, they have other examples, too. I think the other clip, and if it's okay with you, Jordan, I have a, a, it's a little three-minute clip, but I, I really believe in it because instead of someone saying, well, I did some research and I used the Internet and I found a book somewhere, not that these are not extremely valuable, but sometimes hearing from the man who did a head transplant, from the man who was able to remove a brain from an animal and keep it alive, and hear him talk about it himself from his own mouth, his own mind. Um, it might, you know, ring true in somebody and say, you know what, um, it's okay to know about this material, but it's also important to know what you and individually can do in your own research and how you can change your life to adapt yourself to not get stuck in all this stuff and to not get caught up in it and to not get caught up in all the the darkness that um, is being pumped into the system and aim your life in a better direction. Sometimes you have to look at the truth. And I was hoping I could play this little audio clip of two, two and a half yes, minutes. Yes, yes, okay. I'd like to do too. Yeah, I'd like okay. to do that. But uh, also I was going to say that, and just remember that even as far back as 1900, 1910, right around that era, um, Ivan G. Pavlov and A.R. Luria, Pavlov and, and Dr. Luria were working with dogs, uh, you know, the Pavlonian dogs stuff that was going on where they were uh, playing with the brains of animals. Uh, and that was in, uh, you know, in, in the beginning. They were actually going to be working on the human brain, but they were testing out a lot of, uh, of, uh, preliminary research on the animals first. And this was in pre, uh, pre-Soviet Russia, before right. the communists. It was already, uh, the Russians were already working on these, uh, uh these dark experiments that were going to be aimed at the human family later. And so um, and a lot of people know about the Pavlonian dog, but my God, there was so much more uh, to that. And uh, so, yeah, why don't you play this? This was about a doctor who was able to uh, take the brain out of an animal and keep it alive. And I think he's out, he actually was involved with doing the same thing with humans, taking a human brain out and keeping it alive. Uh, it's extraordinary scientific stuff, but it is also, uh, in my opinion, totally sick because it, it, it implies that whoever is at the, at the top of this world in science 
are doing things <clears throat> which are absolutely outrageous, and it doesn't bode well for where the human family is going. And so, yeah, if you want to play that, do that. It's only a couple of minutes long. Sure. Okay, thanks. Dr. Robert White is a neurosurgeon at the Cleveland Medical Hospital in Ohio. Now, oh, here are some pictures. In 1963, he performed the first experiment to keep a brain alive outside the body. That's the human skull here. That's the area. This is the gorilla. See here, when you take the brain out, isolate it, you can take all that if you watch. And you keep it alive and live forever. See, it's, it's, uh, uh, this is a human brain, actually, and it is fixed. So no one needs to worry about it being alive. There have been many attempts throughout the world, particularly in the uh, the old Soviet Union, to take the brain out of an animal, they like the dog, for example, and keep it alive with machinery. Now, you can do that with the heart, the kidney, the liver, the lung, all the other body organs, solid organs. But nobody had ever been able to do it with the brain. And part of the reason is we must remember the brain is very delicate when it comes to its blood supply. And so when we finally did it, and found that this brain uh, of a highly developed animal uh, had brain waves, had biochemistry, was functioning just as it would. Now, we couldn't talk to it. We could send it electrical signals. We could show that it could actually hear and so forth, but we didn't know whether it was processing the information. But the point of it all is that that moment in time also said to us, if you can do it for the animal brain, could do it for the human brain. This, this incredibly brilliant scientist, Stephen Hawking, who is an astrophysicist, actually, he is now in a wheelchair and literally speaks via a computer. And some people, perhaps unkindly, have described this wonderful man as sort of the head on the computer, basically. But uh, he would be somebody who potentially could survive his diseased body through a total body transplant. To prove that the brain was in fact functioning normally while in this state, Dr. White needed to undertake a second experiment, during which he succeeded in transplanting the head of a monkey onto the body of another. The creature survived for seven days before the body rejected the head. In the monkey experiments, these animals are as much a monkey as they were when they were in their own original body. So I would presume, and I'd go beyond that, I would be assured that the monkey personality is retained. So consciousness can be transplanted. Uh, obviously, personality, I'm going to speak of the monkey having personality, can be transferred. And so you might ask, where did this bring us as far as the human spirit or soul goes? And I guess you could argue it can be transplanted. So there's the, the clip. I hope it was clear enough. But um, it's a Dr. White in, in Cleveland, Ohio, in the early 60s that uh, somehow, I mean, just the approach that he's taking, you know, um, like like everybody knows about it, he's just described. I, for me, it was very difficult for me to, to swallow. But, uh, you know, there's... There's all kinds of movies out there, and there's all kinds of media that helps people come to terms with this without it being as shocking. And they, they, you know, they make it more palatable. They have an old TV show, I think, from the early 70s called The Six Million Dollar Man. And uh, it's coming down to another movie in the 70s called The Resurrection of Zachary Wheeler, which is not well known at all. It has yeah, Leslie, yeah. Leslie Nielsen in there. Uh, the guy was in Naked Gun, I'm sure, you know, people, yep. you know, again, um, and also, uh, THX 1138, uh, Ford Coppola and, and Lucas, uh, you know, the, the, all these things. But I think from the more recent, uh, material out there that really stood out to me, uh, are three movies and, or sorry, uh, a TV series called Black Mirror and I think season four is particularly interesting for those of you who have not seen it. I highly recommend it. It was called what? Black Mirror. Hmm. And it's a British, it, it's, it's, well, some of the acting is British and some of it's uh, American, but 
uh, Black Mirror has food for thought about what is happening to the human mind, what is happening to the human spirit, where one episode the soldiers of the future are given an implant and the enemies look like demons. So it's easier for the soldier to take out the the uh, the enemy or the uh, the target. So if I were to project an image into your mind uh, and the person that you have to kill, instead of looking like a little boy or, or a woman in a village or uh, a young man in a farm field, it looks like a seven-armed demon. Well, I think a seven-armed demon holding, you know, 16 knives or something like that, it's going to be easier to, to, to take care of business. Yep. And so um, so these are the kinds of things like, you know, again, Black Mirror is not the, the perfect, perfect answer, but it's just an idea for people to refer themselves to. But a much milder version, much more easier to swallow, is a movie called Code 46. And Code 46 is, you know, it's a movie about um, – uh, artificial intelligence and the epigenetics and the, the weeding out of the, the human genome, you know, the bad, the, sort of the bad apples out of the, 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 the human uh, the genetic pool um, and people to enhance their capabilities. They take viruses that are designer viruses. Uh, but um, I don't want to give away to the movie. It's not a fast-paced movie like the Aven- the Avengers or something like that. It's more of a slower-paced movie. And, and it was called what again? Code 46. Mm. I highly recommend you rent it uh, if it's on Netflix or something like that or if you go to your local store or whatever. But one of the most important uh, uh, movies that I want to mention, and it's not just because it's popular, it's because what it represents. And it's the Terminator. Now, the Terminator, I was going to say, well, gosh, you know, that's nothing new here. But actually, um, James Cameron, I, I, I never really paid attention as much about how do they get these stories. And then as I watched more movies over the years, I said, how did they do it? And the Terminator was, um, I think it was put out in 1984. And uh, the American Film Institute did a survey internally to see all the top 50 um, heroes ever in the movie world and the top 50 villains. And the only one that actually won (laughs) the prize for both was the Terminator. Uh, The Terminator in the first one was the the ultimate, one of the top 50 ultimate bad guys. And um, he was also the number one, one of the top good guys in in the top movies in Terminator 2. And um, I was thinking, uh, the year that the Terminator was set for this horrible future was in 2029. And if I go on the Internet and I look up, uh, uh, I think it's, um, what's the gentleman's name? The Turing Uh, Test. The Turing Test. And he's the man who was saying that computers will double every... uh, uh, in power every 18 months or something like that. Well, there's a futurist yeah. named Ray Kurzweil, and he was predicting that it would be in the year 2020. And that was in 1990. He was saying that the computers and the humans would find the, the computers would reach a point where they could possibly take over. He was making that pres- prediction in 1990. It'd be around 2020, but in the year 20, 20, 2005, excuse me, he revised his estimate to 2029. So uh, Ray Kurzweil is not a type of guy to align his predictions with the movie. He's going to align his predictions with science. He works for Google. He's not he's not working uh, for you know uh, mowing lawns in the summer for extra money. He's uh, he, he's involved with some high end stuff. So if he's saying it's 2029, so then that makes me think. Well, how did James Cameron come up with 2029? He's not guessing either at a multi multi million dollar budget that has to be signed off on years before 1984 where it actually came out. So where are these uh, Hollywood producers and directors getting this knowledge? Again, it comes back to what you were saying, Jordan, these programs, these are decades, if not hundreds of years old, and some people are in the know and some people aren't. Um, So that, and, and the other thing too, is a final note on the Terminator is that uh, in 2008, the Terminator was selected by the Library of Congress for preservation in the National Film Registry because it was deemed culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. 
what that tells me, um, just a regular guy, is that the Library of Congress is not a startup food truck. It's, it's, it's the Library of Congress. And they're not testing out to see if you'll like a, this new type of fish taco. They're, they're basically putting out there that the Terminator is so important as a concept, culturally and historically significant, that they're putting it into their national film registry to preserve it. And so that tells me something, that this is not just a radio a show. No, it's yeah. not just a movie. It's yeah, a, and it's not just a topic just to entertain you. No. So, no, and that should tell you something else, too, about Hollywood. Hollywood made that movie, and, uh, and Schwarzenegger uh, is in it. And that should tell you something, too, from where Schwarzenegger comes from, from uh, Austria. Mm-hmm. And uh, Austria, Germany, and uh, it's, uh, like I said before, there is a far bigger project working right now around the world. And that we think uh, the Nazis were defeated. They were not. Uh, they lost, uh, they lost a battle. They didn't lose the war. They lost a particular battle, but they didn't lose the war. And the war is still on. And uh, then when you find out how big and how powerful and how financially powerful the Nazi party is today around the world. Uh, I've heard, I've heard all kinds of estimates. And I also was reading an article about that that I don't recall where I read it. I don't know if it's true or not, but it was an article dealing with the financing of the Nazi party. And they brought out that, um, in the article, it, it talked about how the Nordic uh, companies, uh, German and Austrian companies, and some in the Nordic area, uh, corporations and companies still pay uh, a percentage, a small percentage of their profits each year to the Nazi party, the old Nazi party. And so that some of the big, you know, like the, some of the big German companies and Austrian companies uh, and from the Netherlands and Sweden are still today sending money to the, old, the Nazis, which are hidden away uh, and, and so they are very well taken, taken care of financially. They have plenty of money. Plus they are operating behind the scenes with black projects in America with the CIA and the uh, NSA and uh, NASA and all, all of these other um, so-called American agencies, which are actually uh, nothing more than Nazi operations, period. The people who are running them are Nazis and people who are working for them uh, for these agencies on Nazis. So uh, the Nazi party is not over. It's not at all over. It's, it's very well uh, conditioned today for what it's doing. It's very highly financed. And uh, all of these really strange uh, movies and stories coming out about crossbreeding animals with humans and Humans uh, interacting with aliens and aliens from other worlds communicating with humans. Uh, you know, even Christianity talks about the good and bad demons, and I mean the good and bad angels, and the bad ones are demons, and they are they are corrupting mankind. Well, I think there's something to that idea, but I think it's scientifically something that the Germans were heavily involved in, and what the United States. And England uh, were heavily involved in. And so it, it, there's a, uh, you know, the bottom line on this, as far as I'm concerned, is that there's a bigger operation going on, something far, far bigger that, that dwarfs whatever we think we're doing in a war. No, there's something very serious going on on the earth that involves all the human family. And we are being messed with by some very highly intelligent but in, uh, but but also intellectually brilliant people who are megalomaniacs and mentally deranged, but they're the mad scientists who are working with uh, off-world entities, off-world uh, technologies. So I just I'm frightened for the future because I can see where the human race is being slowly but surely phased out, and dumbed down, phased out little by little. 
put to death with the uh, chemtrails and all the uh, and, and the poisons in our food and poisons in the air and all this new high technology with uh, uh, with the nanotechnology, fly, you know, flying over uh, American cities and dropping materials which are microscopic by you know trillions of little microscopic uh, uh, technology that we breathe in. That kind of, that we, that goes on to our plants. And when we're harvesting the plants, you're eating these little, uh, highly technical, uh, devices. And so I see the world of mankind is now in serious trouble. But the problems are so large and so enormous in size that I don't think the human family even gets the, uh, you know, we don't get it, how bad off we really are and how frightening this world really, in fact, is and that the Nazis lost the war, but they didn't lose, the, they lost the battle, but they didn't lose the war. Wow. They're still here. They're still here today. We call it American science. All it wow. is is Nazism regurgitated. Uh, you know, the... the Again, I always uh, hesitate about talking about such dark material because I don't want the impression to be that it's all, it's only this. It's just that if you don't know what the picture is, then you're never going to be able to uh, evolve yourself to the next level. You know, if you study this 24-7, you won't, you know, there's going to be some serious problems. But if you do it in a phased approach and if you have good family and friends and you take care of yourself and you do the best you can in your personal life and then you try to incorporate understandings that are 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 1,000 years old, you can be an extremely powerful personal individual. Um, and one of the things I loved, I mean, I don't know if it's available still on the Internet, but if you go on Google and you type in Ghost in Your Genes Documentary, uh, I think it's from the year 2006. There's a whole bunch of results, but the one you want is from the BBC. It's the Ghost in Your Genes 2006. And this one really unlocked a lot of ideas in my mind, and it wasn't scary. It was actually very, very extremely informative, and it helped me understand without uh, the, the, the concern. But at the same time, another example of of, of how transhumanism was being thought of I would dare say one example, it's been done for a long time, but one example as early as 1693 was the Amish people. You know, these people, they're not interested in adapting themselves and, and getting all this kinds of uh, modification. So somebody knew a long, long time ago, hundreds of years ago, that there's going to be a technology that's going to take us off Earth and take us to other planets. It will still be on Earth. But they, we need a, a pool of, uh, of of humans, so we have to create a religion around it. And so the Amish people, and again, I don't have any ill will towards any of these people, but I'm just using the example of these people want to remain as uh, un, uh, um, altered, untouched. Yeah. untouched as possible. So it's not about questioning their religion or questioning, but it's speaking of the wars and the the, the, the darkness, you know, one of the things that's not really well discussed, uh, and I got to make this point quickly, is that each country has its own agenda from the pharmaceutical slash biomedical slash agricultural uh, standpoint. In India, the chances of you dying from Alzheimer's are, are almost zero, but if you're in Canada or the U.S. or some parts of Europe, I mean, it's way up there. And uh, so each country, they're harvesting the data and they're creating a platform so that the humans can be cured if we ever leave this earth and we go to the moon, we go to Mars, we go to somewhere else. We'll have the capability, just like in that movie, I think it's called Elysium, you just sit down in bed and it'll know how to fix you. So that's the upside of technology. But the problem is, is to get to that point, it, a lot of people have to suffer and die. And uh, the uh, other thing, too, is that in today's, you know, geopolitics with this whole thing with uh, uh, immigration, illegal immigration, uh, there's all these problems in the Middle East and, and Islam in particular, is that if I look up the etymology of the word Catholic, it means universal, 
And if I look up the etymology of Islam, it means surrender or submit. Now, of course, they're probably, if the people who are of that faith will probably say, well, you submit to the word of Allah or to the life of Allah or whatever, of God. But it really literally means to surrender. And uh, if I were to pin down what one of your previous guests was saying, I think his name was Kurt, saying that if you're born in the Western world and you have a birth certificate, that basically means you're Catholic. Well, that if that were the case, that means everybody in the entire faith of Islam is a Catholic because they're part of the universal church. And Islam goes to the Vatican. It's not the other way around. And uh, so when the, and I also I really had a hard time finding stuff. It was very difficult to try to find out if Islam was researching as a religion, as a you know religious organized religion, artificial intelligence and transhumanism and the, it's it's super tough to find material i can go on you know at least in english maybe there's vast sums of information in, in their language but i in english it's almost unheard of it's always ai's trying to trying to catch the bad guys using ai instead of them actually studying it and the only two articles that i found was one called um uh 21st century islam artificial intelligence and my goodness, you know, you can find it, but it's, you know, it's not easily found. And uh, one of the things that I find very interesting is that there's a name that I'll, uh, please forgive me if I don't pronounce it correctly, but they're saying if they program a robot with Islam, you know, or the Quran, sorry, uh, as their foundation, you know, that there's a man named the Shaykh Abu Murtad al-Maldifi, and he says how to handle robots whose Islam programming malfunctions or literally what to do with robots that lose their faith. I'm just wondering, does it, to me, I'm, I don't, I don't have multiple doctorates like an astronaut, but to me it doesn't make any sense if a robot losing any faith. And so if a ro, and here's, here's a quote from him, if a robot were to commit apostasy, claims the Sheikh, it will be an important jurisprudential issue. Well, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cut it off here because we're just running out of time.